Bibles, if you would please, if you wouldn't mind, stand with me. Let's go to the book of Lamentations. Book of Lamentations. I love a missions conference at a missions month. I think that's absolutely wonderful. I love missionaries. Missionaries are my heroes. And uh, thank God for those that are willing to take the Word of God and you know, on our behalf and uh, go across the world to get the gospel to people. The need is overwhelming. And the longer we live in this country of ours, we see the need is overwhelming. And uh, so I'm, I'm privileged, and I hope the things we share with you today would be a help to you and that you're asking God, not just deciding according to your calculations, but asking God what He wants you to give uh, in this matter of, of giving to worldwide missions and uh, by faith. And uh, it's a great privilege and opportunity to do that. Lamentations, we're just going to look at one verse. We'll get into the message. Lamentations chapter 1 and verse 12. Jeremiah records in verse 12, Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? I want to preach on that this morning. The title of the message could be, Is it nothing to you? We could entitle the message, Who cares? Who cares? Do you? Do you really care? Our churches are full of Christians that are satisfied to sit in the pew and do nothing else. But we're left here for a reason. And what a, what a wonderful purpose that God has allowed us to stay here as ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to preach on that this morning. Who cares? Let's ask the Lord to help us. Our Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. We're sure nothing without thee. Lord, you know the heart of every person here. I don't know the heart. I don't know what people are dealing with and the struggles of life. But Lord, you know all these things. God, I sure want to be a blessing. I want to be a help this morning. I want to be a help to your church. Lord, you know we need great moving Holy Spirit of God. Your church is across our land. Help us this morning. As I yield to you, would you please fill me and endue me. Help me to say what you once said in the way that you want it said this morning. Would you help us be humble enough, Lord, to have ears to hear, hearts that are willing to do what you speak to us about. Lord, should there be somebody here that's never been saved, not sure if they died that they'd go to heaven, would you please draw those hearts to come to Jesus this morning. Those of us that are saved, would you do a work in our hearts, Lord? Maybe there's some repentance that needs to take place today. Maybe, Lord, there's some encouragement and strengthening that needs to take place. Certainly, we pray that you would guide each and every believer here, Lord, to give what your, your desire is for them to give in this matter of the faith promise mission. We're blessed now this service we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. He was a man with a tremendous burden. I have great admiration for, for Jeremiah. I don't believe that I could have done what Jeremiah did. I like to preach and see people respond. It's hard for me to preach and not see people respond. But Jeremiah spent his entire ministry preaching without response. But he fulfilled the will of God. He did what God asked him to do. And I have great respect and admiration for Jeremiah. You see, at this point, Jerusalem was besieged by her enemies. She'd been given over to plunder and murder and fire and desolation. The streets were stained with blood of her sons and daughters. Her houses were broken down and the glorious temple was defiled and laying in ashes. And Jeremiah just couldn't understand why nobody seemed to care. He couldn't understand why everybody wasn't burdened. He couldn't understand why everyone didn't want to do something. You know, I read in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 7, it says, There's none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. 
I read in, in Ezekiel twenty two thirty. I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, and I found none. But sad statements. And we look at our country and our society today, and I want to tell you folks, we can gripe all that we want to about Joe Biden and, and Nancy Pelosi and the rest of them, and I do. But I want to tell you, it's not the responsibility of Washington, D.C. to have revival across our land. The responsibility is in the hands of God's people. He said, if my people called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will heal their, 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 uh, and forgive their sin and heal their land. You see, God put the responsibility in our hands we're at a time in our, our, our society where the so-called Christianity today is all about comfort. It's all about feeling good. And I want to tell you something. When you're yielded to God, it feels good. But that doesn't mean that you don't have burdens and responsibilities and trials. And the modern type of preaching today is that God's people, just, just look at what, what can be done for you. Look what the church can do for you. It's not the, the, the burden anymore of, dear Lord, look what you've done for me. What can I do for you? Amazingly, when Paul got saved on the Damascus Road that day, the first thing he said was, Lord, what wilt thou have me to? Lord, after you've done this for me, what can I do for you, Lord? And here Jeremiah sees the, the temple. It's, it was the representation of the glory of God. And it's in shambles. And he goes by and says, is it nothing to you? Oh, ye that pass by, you're just okay? To let this all happen and it, you, nobody's weeping, nobody's burdened, nobody wants to, 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 to put their hand to the plow to help out. Who cares? Is it nothing to you? I look at our country. The nation that my daddy fought for in World War II is just about nothing but a memory. But who cares? I mean, churches are anemic and have little power of influence but who cares? Preachers have become seminar speakers, first-class CEOs, but no evidence of the power of God, but who cares? Youth groups have become fun-time social clubs with bigger and better entertainment, but who cares? Teenagers are dying. Number two reason, suicide. Number three reason, murder. But who cares? I want you to consider with me, and I'll try to get through it quickly this morning. Please consider with me why it should mean something to you. Why should you care? Why you should do something? Number one, because of the cross. Look at Galos, uh, Galatians, Galatians, and we'll get it. Galatians chapter 6. I just about made up a new book of the Bible, Colossians, you know, cross between Galatians and Colossians. Galatians chapter 6, look at verse 14. Here Paul says, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Paul said, What motivates me is the cross. God forbid that I should glory in anything else but the cross. Look over there at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is a verse that is so powerful to me. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20 it says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be you reconciled to God. For he hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Does that do something to you? He, Jesus, who all he'd ever known since the beginning of the beginning was the glory of heaven, the angels that adored and worshipped him, perfect fellowship with the Father, peace, glory and he left that 
to become sin for you and me. He that was holy, he that had never suffered before, he that had, had never experienced the, 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 the detriment of sin, was willing to go to Calvary and suffer for you and me and take up on, on him my sin. I wish I didn't even know all the sin. And I, I, I don't know some of the sin. I'm sure that I've, my old heart's deceived me. But the sin I've committed in my lifetime, to think that the perfect son of God was willing at Calvary to take that sin on him who had never known sin, he had never thought a wrong thought, he had never committed an evil deed in all of his life, he had never done anything with a wrong motive. And he took my sin upon him at Calvary. That knew no sin. Listen, I grew up in a Christian home, my dad was a preacher and and, and I grew up in a preacher's home, and I've heard it all of my entire life. i got to tell you, there's one thing I never get tired of hearing a sermon on. I never get tired of hearing a sermon on Calvary. To this day, still, as it's described, how he took the beating and how the beard was ripped out of his face, and how the spittle was upon him, how every joint in his body was dislocated. And I want to tell you, all the physical suffering we look at doesn't compare to the burden of taking sin. You remember the scripture tells us that God the Father turned his back because he couldn't look upon sin. And Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He did that for you. Is it nothing to you? I'm amazed. At God's people today that want to fuss about standards, that want to fuss about separation in their life. Well, preachers preach against this and preach against that. Yeah, we live in enemy territory. But I mean, is there anything too much for the Lord to ask of me? Am I not allowed? I mean, is it too much for the Lord to tell me how to be the right ambassador and representative for Him? Is it too much that the Lord asked me to come back on a Sunday night for church and a Wednesday night for church? I mean, look what he did for us. Is it nothing? It ought to be something because of the cross. Paul said, it's what constantly motivates me. In Galatians 1.10, it said that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. I was in high school. My dad, who was out of the ministry during that time, he went through some serious health problems and the doctor told my dad he was going to die if he didn't get out of the ministry. So during those years, my teenage years, my dad was out of the ministry. We still went to church. Dad taught Sunday school. But I remember I gave my heart and life to the Lord. I'd gotten saved as a boy, but I'd gotten backslidden, and I was playing ball and all about the Friday night lights and all that kind of junk and all about trying to impress everybody. I remember God breaking my heart. As a freshman in high school, into my freshman year, and I was going to play varsity football the next year and varsity basketball. I'd already played varsity baseball as a freshman, and I was pretty impressed with myself. But God wasn't so impressed. My friends all around me going to hell. My testimony stunk. And I didn't even care enough to tell them how to be saved. Never prayed for them. I remember sitting in a service where God broke my heart. I went forward weeping and said, Dear Lord, I don't want to be in charge anymore. I don't want to take, take charge anymore. I remember so oftentimes after a ball game, I'd oftentimes go back when I'd get home and I'd go to my room and I'd just take out a hymn book I had in my room. And I'd read it and that's, that hymn face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face, what will it be? When in rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. I thought and think about, Lord, when I face you, have I made what's important to you important to me? You see, forever we'll be reminded of the cross. When we stand before him, we'll see those wounds in his hands, in his side, where he was wounded for you and me. For all of eternity, is it nothing to you? 
Is your, does your dedication come up to that for him? Not only because of the cross, but it ought to mean something to us because of the cries. Look over to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Apostle Paul, he wanted to go into to Asia, and the Lord forbid him to go, and there was a cry coming in verse 9. It says, A vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. See, there was the cry of somebody that didn't know the answer, needed some direction. It ought to, it ought to move us. We ought to care because of the cries of those that don't know the Lord, those that have no, no, no direction. The Bible tells us that, that uh, in Matthew chapter 9 that the Lord was moved with compassion when he looked on him as a as sheep without a shepherd. He was moved with compassion. Why did it matter to him? Because these people didn't have the answer, and he is the answer. Your pastor said this morning, in every problem we deal with in life, he is the answer, and he really is, and he really can meet all of our needs. I mean, there's, there's about 7.8 or more, I think now, billion population in the world. Three billion of unreached groups that have never heard the gospel. They say 105 people die every minute of the day. From the time of Christ till now, they say 67% of those who've walked this earth never heard of the salvation of Jesus Christ. Is it nothing to you? Who cares? The cries from hell, the rich man is, is talked about in Luke 16 where he died and went to hell. And the Bible says in hell he lifted up his eyes. Father Abraham, have mercy on me and dip the tip of your finger in water and cool my tongue. Listen to me, hell is not something some preacher made up. It's something very real. And people that die without Jesus Christ in America or in, 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 in Asia or in Africa, they die and spend an eternity in hell. Who cares? Public schools around here become little camps of Propaganda, teaching young people absolutely everything anti-scriptural. Who cares? There's still a mission field. Those young people need Jesus is what they need. And the Lord allows a church to be in a, in a, in a, in a place, not by mistake, but we're his ambassadors. We're to get the message out that these people are lost forever without the Lord Jesus Christ. The saddest thing about hell is it's forever. Once people go to hell, they don't get another chance. There is no escape. Dr. Hyman Appleman was an old-time preacher. I had the privilege to hear him on a couple of occasions. He was a Jewish man that got saved in his 30s, and, he, and I heard him. It was in, like in his 80s at that time. He gave a very, very fervent invitation all the time. He said his tears were running down his cheeks. He said, my, my grandchildren, now my great-grandchildren say, Grandpa, why? Why do you keep going and, and traveling to all these churches? You're in places that you wake up and don't even know what, what city you're in or what church you're supposed to preach in. And why do you keep going? Why don't you let somebody else do it? Hyman Appleman stood there with the tears flowing and he said, because when I was in my 30s and I began to study the Bible and I came to know Jesus as my Savior, I realized there's a hell where people go to for all of eternity and somebody's got to tell them. Do you care? What involvement are you having in reaching people for Jesus? One of the greatest opportunities in the in the church is to give to missions, to reach people across the world 
that would have no other hope if a missionary didn't go. And God, God doesn't lead all of us to go to a foreign mission field, but He leads all of us to be involved in it. I was preaching last year in Michigan. A deacon in the church, a real faithful man, came up and he should have had a rough year this past year, Brother Booth. And I said, man, I'm sorry to hear that. He, he had a, has a dairy farm and several hundred, hundred dairy cattle. And he said, we had a storm come through. And early, early in the morning hours, I, I, I woke and I thought, man, I need to check out some things. He said, I walked out and I saw that the storm had blown over uh, the... Uh, I forget what you call it, the, the big box, the electrical, pardon me. Somebody say it. Transformer, yes, thank you. My dementia kicked in for a minute. That transformer had fallen over on his metal barn. So when I walked out, Brother Booth, I could hear it fried over 200 cattle. He said, I'll never forget. He began to weep. He said, I'll never forget the sound. He says, as I was walking near the barn, I could hear all I could think of what it must sound like in hell. He said, it was just a, a, a massive groan. He said, and all I could think of was what it must sound like in hell. I'm sure it doesn't even come close to what it sounds like in hell. Do we care? I mean, honestly, I get grief sometimes when I go to churches and pastors tell me, yeah. I say, what, where's Brother So-and-so? He was here last time. Yeah, he, you know, he got upset about something, you know. Somebody didn't ask somebody to do this or that, and they, they got upset. They left. Really? Folks, the cause is too great. I mean, there's a hell out there. And the Lord's left us here. We've got to get beyond the little things and get focused on the main thing. We ought to care because of the cross. We ought to care because of the cries. We ought to care because of the commission. Because the Lord told us in Matthew chapter 28, you'd like to turn there real quick. I'm sure you've heard it probably several times in this month. Matthew 28 and verse 19. It's a tremendous passage here where the Lord is resurrected from the dead and now He calls His disciples together and He wants to speak to them. What in the world is He going to say? He's risen from the dead. He's paid for sin. He's bought our redemption and now He's got His disciples together after His resurrection. He's about to ascend into heaven. What's He going to tell them? He says in verse 19, Go ye therefore. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Lo, I'm with you all the way even unto the end of the world. He says, this is what I want you to be about. you got to get the gospel everywhere. It's the only hope for man. Romans 10, verse 14, it says, But how shall they hear without a preacher? so the Lord left us here to preach. Not everybody's called to pastor. Not everybody's called to be an evangelist. But every person's called to give the gospel. Every person that's saved were left here to give the gospel. Everybody ought to be involved in that. And then the opportunity for those, because we can't go across the world. Not all of us can go. But we can, we can pay for those to go for us. We can certainly give so they can be involved in reaching others for Christ. i never forget, I was in a missions conference and one of the, the missionaries, and he's been to our football camp several times, and he had played in a real big high school in the Atlanta area, and, and um, he was an a, he a, a offensive tackle. And uh, so that meant on the line he would, he would block and help protect the running back or the quarterback. And, and so he said they were playing in a big major school, and he said he'll never forget. He said, I, I, I was, we, we, the quarterback called the play, and he said we're running off 
off tackle. He said, I was going to block out this defensive end who was big. He said he was just a monster. He said, I went out and I, I gave it all my old man. He said, the next thing I remember is, is coming to and my face is in the mud. He said, I got up and he said, I, I, I ran over to the huddle and I'm picking the, the mud out of my, my face mask. And he said in the huddle, he said, fellas, let's run that again. I'll get it this time. And he said, the guy says, hey, you're in the wrong huddle, buddy. Go get in your huddle. <laughs> he said, he ran over and got in his huddle and, and he said, um, he said, hey, fellas, he said, listen, I'll, I'll get it this time, run that play again. He said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, fellas, I, I, I can't see, I can't see. And he said, all of a sudden, his, his teammate grabbed his, his helmet and turned it around where he could see. <laughs> he said, man, by the end of the game, he said, I'm bloody, I'm muddy, I'm beat up. He said, but we won the game. He said, uh, I'm standing by my coach, and this guy comes out of the stands, and he says, uh, he says um, well, coach, we... We did it again. We won again. He said, I'm thinking, really? We? Here you are in your Abercrombie outfit, all clean, and we? What did you do? He said, I didn't say it, but I'm thinking. He said, he walked off, and I, he, said, he, he said to the, his coach, he said, can you believe the audacity of that guy? We won it again. What did he do? He says, man, look at me. He said, he's all clean and enjoyed the stands. His coach said, hey, guess what, Spencer? He paid for that equipment you got on. He said, oh, guess it was we. Can I tell you something? The missionary can't do it without you. You ever think about a family over there in a foreign country? Missing Christmas, birthdays, grandma and grandpa aren't there. Their hearts are just trying to win people to Christ there. The church calls and says, sorry, our mission's giving's down. We can't support you anymore. What a tragedy. In America? Listen, when it comes to this matter of giving to missions, we ought to say, dear Lord, not can I, can I do what I did last. Lord, would you let me do more? Would you help me, Lord, that I could do more? Lord, these missionaries need somebody to hold the ropes for them. Lord, help me to do more. You see, we're responsible with the commission to get the gospel to all the world. And that's the privilege of faith promise missions. But it comes down to, is it nothing to you? Jeremiah's looking places in shambles. Nobody's walking around crying or worried or saying, how can we rebuild? It's just like, well, it is what it is. You're a child of God. Let's never let that happen to us. Is it nothing to you, oh, you that pass by? I got 20 grandkids. I remember when I was younger, I used to pray and say, dear Lord, I don't know what it's going to be like when my kids get older. Now I got grandchildren. Growing up in this world, they're doing transgender surgeries to children. Are you kidding me? Who would have ever thought? Is it nothing to you? you? Say, well, what can we do? We can do what we can do. We could say, dear God, use us. Help us to win souls around here. Help us to, to not sit and idle. Help us to be dedicated. Help us to have a right testimony. Help us to represent you right, Lord. And Lord, is, is, is the, the, the need is great all across our land and all across our country. God, help us to support these who are spreading the gospel. So the question this morning is, who cares? Maybe you're here this morning. The truth is, if you died right now, you're not sure you'd go to heaven. I'm here to tell you the best news in the world. That can be settled by trusting Christ as your Savior. It's not about joining a church. It's not about being baptized. It's not about putting money in an offering plate. You, you get to heaven by trusting Jesus who paid for your sin at Calvary. He rose again that third day. He offers you the gift of eternal life. It is the greatest, most wonderful thing when you make that decision to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That can be done today.
And you can leave here knowing for sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. Probably some of us ought to come to an altar this morning and say, Dear Lord, I used to have a burden for lost people. I used to try to witness to people. It's been a long time, Lord. Long time since I have shed tears on my pillow at night for a lost family member, for a lost neighbor. Long time, Lord, since I've tried to knock on somebody's door to tell them about Jesus. Long time, Lord, since I've really cared. Some of us probably ought to come to an altar and say, Dear Lord, forgive me for not being more committed and faithful. The preacher was talking about transitioning. I love that, that introductory sermon. <laughs> transitioning from coming to look for help all the time to realize we're soldiers of Jesus Christ. Paul said to Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier. You're not tiddly winks. We're in a spiritual war. Satan is our enemy. He's having a heyday. He knows his time is short. So if ever there's a time, there's a call for greater dedication, commitment. It's today. Maybe you've never did, did what I, I didn't, hadn't done until I was a 15 years old and I came to an altar and said, Dear Lord, I don't want to be in charge anymore. I want it to be all about you. It was only about two months after that God called me to preach. Never been anything else in my mind except to try to fulfill that call. God, speak in your heart this morning. Let's not hesitate. God knows we need something to happen. You bow your heads with me, please. Our Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us, Lord. I pray that you'd stir us, Lord. It seems like the great attack of Satan today is this matter of apathy. We've just gotten so used to things. We're just holding on. Lord, would you help us restore the burden and the passion and concern about the lost souls that are going to hell, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be more committed to reaching people here and reaching people across the world. Maybe some, Lord, need to come and just say, Lord, I haven't really prayed and sought you as much as I should have about what I should give to missions this year. So would you have your will at this invitation time? Heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody looking, I want to ask you this morning. Can you say, Brother Booth, thank God, if I died right now, I know without a doubt I'd go to heaven. I remember where I was when I realized that I deserved going to hell and Somebody showed me from the Bible how I could put my faith and trust in Jesus. And with a repentful heart, I called on the Lord and asked him to forgive me and save me. And I could take you to that place, Brother Booth, that I remember where I trusted Christ as my Savior. Say, yeah, Brother Booth, that's my testimony. I know without a doubt I'm saved and on my way to heaven. Would you slip your hand up indicating that? God bless you. Thank you. You may put your hands down. I won't embarrass anybody. I promise you that. I want you to be honest with the Lord this morning. I wonder how many would say, Brother Booth, as a Christian, I needed that this morning. The Holy Spirit of God is speaking to my heart. There may be somebody in particular in mind that you've not witnessed to and told them about Lord Jesus Christ. It may be that you've just, through life's struggles and distractions, you've gotten away from being that soul winner that you used to be. Maybe you haven't prayed like you should about this matter of giving to mission. You say somewhere during the message this morning, the Holy Spirit's dealing with my heart as a Christian, some things I know I need to get settled with the Lord. Pray for me. Would you slip your hands up, Christians? God spoke to your heart this morning. God bless you. Thank God for you. You may put your hands down. Thank the Lord for tender hearts. Maybe there's others. Maybe something I didn't even mention, or maybe God spoke to you during the Sunday school hour about something. Say, Brother Booth, I didn't raise my hand just now, but God is dealing with me, and there's some things I do need to settle with the Lord this morning. Include me in the prayer. I didn't raise my hand before, but I'm raising it now. Include me. Pray for maybe something I never even mentioned. Say, the Lord's mentioning to me. Just slip your hand up, put it down. Anybody else? See a young hand. I wonder if there's somebody who would say, to be honest with you, if I died right this minute, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. Don't want to die and go to hell. If I could know for sure, according to the Bible, that I was saved and forgiven on my way to heaven, 
I'd like to know that for sure. Please pray for me. You slip your hand up, just put it up and put it down. I'd like to pray for you. I won't embarrass you. I'd like to pray for you if you let me. That's me. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. But I'd like to know that for sure. Pray for me. Put your hand up, put it down. Just a moment, we're going to stand for prayer. After I pray, piano will begin to play. If God spoke to your heart this morning, let's not hesitate. Let's find a place at the altar. Do what God spoke to our hearts about. Ask Him for that grace to have the victory He wants us to have. Would you stand with me, please?